In the summer of 1998, I had only one game that my heart was set on. I took some odd jobs doing lawn care, carrying a weed eater until my arms were ready to fall off. But finally, I had the money I needed to buy the game that I'd been so desperate to get my hands on. My mom took me to Walmart and dropped me off. I rushed to the electronics department and there it was on the shelf. The game I'd been dreaming of getting a hold of for so long. Metal Gear Solid. There was only one problem. It was rated M. The associate wouldn't sell me the game and my mom wasn't there to get it for me. I was devastated. I didn't get new games very often and this was supposed to be a special moment for me. And now it was ruined. I took a moment to compose myself and decided to see just what else was in stock. Now, I knew I wanted to get the most game for my buck and after a few minutes my eyes settled on Final Fantasy 7. Two things drew me to this game. First was the case. Right on it. It had three discs and of course more discs meant more game. The second was a story that I was told by a friend at school. My buddy Andy had Final Fantasy 7 and was saying that it was so crazy. He told me about this scene where the main character falls and he swore that he fell for like 30 minutes before he finally hit the bottom. Now what he didn't tell me until later was that his game glitched on the animation, but I thought, eh, hey, this is okay for now. I'll play it and then I'll just save up and buy Metal Gear Solid later in the fall. What I didn't know was that I was about to play a game that would change my life. Final Fantasy VII is one of my all-time favorite video games. I've dumped countless hours into exploring all that it has to offer. From the themes, the characters, the plot, music, and gameplay, this is a masterpiece. I've been wanting to make a video about this game since I first started the channel, but I've been worried that I wouldn't do it justice. And even now I'm still worried as I'm working on it that this won't live up. Now, this won't be taking into account any of the multitude of media that's surrounding the game, so there won't be talk of Advent Children, the remake, or any of that. In this video, we will be diving into the PS1 classic, looking at what drew me in, what made this game so special to me, because the only experience I can tell you about is my own. So please join me in this journey as I revisit the game changer, the epic that is Final Fantasy VII. The story of Final Fantasy VII is one of the most impactful and lasting of any game that I've ever experienced, and it's a story of unreliable narrators. The cast is diverse, with each member of your party having their own story, their own tragedy and adversity that they must overcome. The world is in peril. Through corporate greed and corruption, an organization known as the Shinra Electric Power Company has become the controlling body of pretty much the entire planet. With their Mako reactors sucking the very life out of the planet in order to provide electricity to the people while Shinra lines their pockets with gold, or gill as the case may be. Mako, as we come to learn, is the very life essence of the planet. Shinra has developed their own military forces, secret service, and have got their fingers in pretty much everything that goes on in the world. The deeper into this game that you get, the worse Shinra becomes. And even the game's ultimate villain, Sephiroth, can be considered to be the fault of Shinra. Despite that though, the game is more than just a game about preserving the environment and saving the planet. It is so much more, as we're about to dive in and uncover. The game opens with a cutscene that's focusing on Eris. And yes, I'm calling her Eris, as that's who she was for me. No Aerith here. Sorry. But after showing Aerith walking through a pretty rough looking neighborhood, the video zooms out to reveal Midgar, the massive city on a plate. This is the seat of power for Shinra. The city is surrounded by several reactors that power the massive metropolis. A shining Mako powered beacon of greed, wealth, and power at all costs. The camera then zooms in as the train is arriving outside of one of the reactors, and as it stops, out bursts the rebel group Avalanche, consisting of Biggs, Wedge, Jesse, and Barrett Wallace, the group's brutish leader. You are the newcomer 
a mercenary named Cloud Strife. The only things that we know at this point about Cloud is that he's confident, indifferent to the cause, and was a member of an elite military force called Soldier, which is in all caps. After dispatching a few guards, you make your way into a reactor, which is your target for the mission. Barrett doesn't trust you and sticks with you as you make your way deeper in. Once you get to the depths of the reactor, a flash of text appears on screen, a voice in Cloud's head saying, look out, this is no ordinary reactor. Now after this, Cloud insists that he's okay, and he sets the bomb to blow the reactor before you get greeted with the first boss, the Guard Scorpion. This opening tutorial mission is one of the best that I've played in any video game. It's action packed and drops you right in the deep end on an important mission and moment in the world, but it provides enough support to keep you from sinking. After you take down the guard scorpion, a timer goes off and you have to scramble out of the reactor, helping Jesse who gets her legs stuck before narrowly escaping a massive explosion that shakes the entire city. Congratulations! You're now an eco-terrorist. Welcome to Final Fantasy VII. After the escape, you go your separate ways and you meet Eris for the first time. She's selling flowers, which are a real rarity in this city. After that introduction, you get chased by soldiers and jump off of a bridge to escape onto the train. Barrett runs everyone off and clears out the train car, and you get to spend some time hanging out with your cohorts. Jesse shows you how the train system works, and Barrett gives some introspection as Cloud asks why people don't just move out of the slums and leave Midgar. Barrett shows some depth here, stating that maybe they have no place else to go, or maybe they just love their land no matter how polluted it gets. Which shows that this muscle-bound angry brute does have a lot more to him. Barrett is not a one-dimensional character. He is well-developed, and he has far more depth than that harsh exterior would ever suggest. Once you depart the train, you walk into an entirely different world. Any vision of exploring this futuristic, modern world is shattered. You're in the slums. A city buried under another, literally. Now the picture's becoming clearer. The poor are constantly made poorer as the rich get richer. Those who have live on plates with all of the world's amenities to make their lives comfortable. Those who have not live under a city, a land devoid of almost all vegetation. The soil is sucked dry by the reactors. The air is polluted by the gases that are let off by these reactors, and there's not much hope to be had here, but the people still live and they make the best of it. As Barrett said on the train, maybe they just love their land no matter how polluted it gets. Cloud and the others will head into the Sector 7, one of the many villages under the plates, as the city has been divided up into sectors, each with its own reactor and district, made to provide something to the city above. The slums, as we are later told, were all once their own villages before Shinra constructed Midgar. Barrett rushes into a bar called the Seventh Heaven and runs out everybody else before letting the rest of Avalanche enter. Cloud heads inside and you learn another layer to Barrett's character. He's a father. He's not just fighting for the planet's sake. He has a child that he's bringing up and he wants to preserve the world for her. Cloud is then reunited with his childhood friend, Tifa Lockhart, and the two catch up briefly before Cloud goes to speak with Barrett about the job. There's a fight and Tifa stops Cloud from leaving, reminding him of a promise that they made years ago 
that he would rescue her if she ever needed saving. Cloud has a change of heart and agrees to stick around, at least for now. The very next day, Avalanche takes off on another bombing mission, taking down another reactor, but this time things are going to be a little bit different. Tifa joins, and this time, after an alarm sounds on the train, Tifa, Barrett, and Cloud have to jump before making their way up along the tracks to the reactor. Things do seem to go smoother this time around, but as you're leaving the reactor, President Shinra shows up and lets you know that you've walked into a trap. The party fights the Airbuster, but after the battle it explodes and leaves Cloud hanging on a suspended walkway for his life. And then as the reactor blows, the shockwave from the explosion shakes Cloud off, leaving him to fall, although not for 30 minutes as I'd previously been led to believe. Cloud wakes up in a church miraculously alive and unscathed and is greeted by Eris, who was there tending flowers, as the church was one of the few places in Midgar where flowers would still grow. This is where you find out that she is being pursued by a group known as the Turks, Shinra's secret service. They make their escape through the roof of the rundown church before retreating to Eris's home. Her mother, Myra, realized that Cloud was in Soldier and asked him to leave in the middle of the night not wanting Eris caught up in the mess that he was clearly already involved in. Cloud slips out and tries to make his way back to Sector 7, but Eris is already waiting on him and insisting that she's going to escort Cloud back home. When they reach the gates to Sector 7, the two stop and talk for a little bit, with Cloud learning that Eris already has a history with another member of Soldier named Zack, although Cloud doesn't know who he is. They're interrupted as a carriage passes by and Cloud sees Tifa on board, heading to a small inner city known as the Wall Market. Eris and Cloud head after Tifa and things get weird. Wall Market is a lively yet extremely seedy district, ran by a wretch named Don Corneo. You find out that Tifa is inside the Don's mansion and the only way in is if you're a woman. Which leads to Eris having a brilliant idea. I remember this entire quest playing out as a kid, trying not to laugh as I felt mildly uncomfortable playing along as Cloud worked to solve people's problems so that he could get the outfit he needed to pose as a woman and get into the mansion. The highlight of this journey is easily the Honeybee Inn, which even as a kid I realized was a brothel. Now you manage to get inside and well, on my latest playthrough, I've tried to stick as close as I can to my memory of what I did 25 years ago. Cloud ends up passing out in a room and waking up being potentially assaulted in a, uh, we'll just say, intimate manner. Sorry, we know what it is, but I don't want to upset YouTube here. By a scantily clad man. But your HP and MP are restored, so anyways. You get changed and Eris picks out a nice dress before you both make your way back to the mansion. Inside, you explore and find Tifa waiting in a dungeon. After realizing that the muscular woman in front of her is Cloud, she tells him that there's reports of Don Corneo possibly leaking information about Avalanche to Shinra. 
So she came here trying to get that information from him. And the Don just happens to pick three girls and chooses one to be his bride, right? And now there's three girls. Eris volunteers to help as well. The three are then taken up to meet Don Corneo, and at this point, three possibilities can play out. Depending on how you fared in getting the outfit, the Don can choose any of the three. I remember on my first playthrough, I did poorly and he chose Tifa. This time though, I did my best and he chose Cloud. Now, there's two ways to play this, good cop or bad cop. The first time I reached this point, I played it tough, but on subsequent playthroughs, I found it much more entertaining to let Cloud just see how far things can go. Eventually getting caught by a very confused Tifa and Eris. Corneo confesses that Shinra is out to take Avalanche down and plans to do so by literally dropping Sector 7's upper plate to crush the slums below. Now before you can rush off, the Don pulls the rug out from under the group literally as he drops them down into the sewers below. At this point the three have to rush and fight their way back to Sector 7 where the rest of Avalanche is fighting with the Shinra trying their best to save the slums. This entire situation is both gripping and horrifying. Eris is sent to try to rescue Barrett's daughter Marlene and get her out of Sector 7. You get to see your friends one last time as they're all badly wounded in battle, each reflecting on their actions, realizing that the things that they have done to try to save the planet have certainly cost many other lives in the process. Now once you reach the top platform, Tifa and Cloud reunite with Barrett and take on Reno, a member of the Turks. But try as you can, he does manage to detonate the tower holding up the plate. Another of the Turks, their leader Singh, then shows up and lets you know that he has kidnapped Eris, who shouts out to you that she is okay. Scrambling, Barrett finds a guide wire, and the three jump on it and manage to ride the wire out of harm's way barely avoiding their own demise as the scene cuts to President Shinra smugly watching the destruction that he orchestrated. This man doesn't care about the people living in the slums and he doesn't even care about the people living on the plate as countless casualties were racked up just to appease this evil leader and just crush a small rebellion. Outside the slums, back in the abandoned playground where Cloud was speaking with Eris, the three are left to take into account what just happened. Their home was gone. Their friends were dead. Barrett's lost. His grief and anger overwhelm him. Tifa's heartbroken. Even as a player, you've been traveling with these other members of Avalanche from the start. It hurts knowing that they're gone now. Shinra did it again. You don't know yet just what they've done to you in the past, but these three were all hurt by them yet again. As a player, you just spent a fair bit of time with these characters. Final Fantasy VII is great at sucking you in and making you feel like you're really in the game. When they were killed and the reality set in, I was gutted. I understand the pain of the loss and I felt lost just as these three do. Thankfully, in the midst of an impossible situation, Tifa suggests that Eris must have been talking about Marlene when she said she is safe. Clinging to hope, Cloud leads the crew back to Myra's home, where Marlene is found safe. They apologize to Myra, who informs them that she isn't Eris's real mother, she adopted her when her real mother tragically passed away. 
We're introduced briefly to the war that Shinra waged with Wu Tai years before, and this is just a talking point thrown in as just passing, as if anyone in the world would naturally know what she's talking about here, which just adds to the depth of the world, letting us understand that it's lived in. And they don't take the time to beat this over your head and explain in detail that there was this great war, but they talk about it in a way that you can understand. Myra's husband was killed in action. Eris's mother, and thereby Eris, were members of a disappearing race called the Ancients, or as we learn later, the Cetra, the original inhabitants of the planet. That's why Shinra is after Eris. She's important to them, as they believe that she can lead them to the Promised Land, the place that they believe will have an abundant supply of Mako energy that they can tap into. Corporate greed at its very lowest. Barrett asks Myra if she can watch Marlene a little bit longer and promises that they're going to rescue Eris. Now, with the party still reeling from their losses, they make their way back to the wall market in search of a way to reach the upper plate, a way to reach Shinra headquarters. After a bit of searching, Cloud and Co. find a hanging wire that they can climb to make their way up to the Shinra building. Fear, pain, and grief are turned to resolve. We will do this. We must do this. Even more than revenge, this is about saving Eris. She had gotten caught up helping them, and now they're going to do whatever it takes. There's two paths that you can take when you get here, and I chose to take the same one that I almost always end up taking. The party makes a long and arduous climb up 60 flight of stairs, sneaking through a back door into the building. Once you get inside, there's puzzles on every floor to get key cards needed to get to a higher level. You find that some people who love their jobs and there's others, like the mayor of Midgar, who hate Shinra. And after solving a few puzzles, you make your way higher, eventually reaching the laboratory of Professor Hojo. Hojo is the head of the Shinra Science Division. And here you're reunited with Eris, but before you can rescue her, Cloud sees something that triggers a flashback. Inside a holding cell is the body of Genova, believed to be an ancient, and more will become known with her in due time. After Cloud comes back to his senses, you rescue Eris and you pick up a new companion, the talking cat, dog, lion thing, Red 13. We learn later on that his real name is Nanaki, and now I always give him that name because after some of the events later on, it just makes sense. So while right here, it makes no sense to know it, just, just give it time. You attempt to escape, but you end up being captured by the Turks and taken before the president, who's most pleased to have you all, and then you're tossed in cells and left to wait for your fate. After brief conversations with the other party members, everyone decides that the only thing left to do is to just go to sleep. And that's where everything changes. Cloud is woken up to find that the door to his cell is unlocked. Heading outside, he finds a dead guard, and then he runs to free the rest of the group, and they make their way out following a blood trail. You have no idea what monster could have done this, or the extent of the damage that's been done. You just have to follow the trail. As you move, you pass the cell that held Genova, and it is ripped open. Once you reach the president's office, you find President Shinra dead. A massive sword ran through him. The Masamune, or Masamune, whatever, I cannot pronounce it. But as Cloud tells us, this is the personal weapon of Sephiroth. Now, despite these revelations, the party has no time to think this through. 
As the president's son, Rufus Shinra, arrives just outside of the room on the roof. The group goes out to meet him as he appoints himself as the new head of Shinra and vows to be a more cruel leader than his father had ever been. Cloud sends everyone else away and fights Rufus. Tifa waits on him, and when they reach the bottom, they learn that the military has the building surrounded. There's no getting out of this. For any other game, this would feel like the climax. Now my first playthrough, I thought it was, but as we learn, you can never count out Cloud or any of these characters. They steal a truck and a motorcycle and burst through a window landing on the highway. They're then pursued by Shinra soldiers as well as another massive Shinra machine determined to kill the party. But after you dispatch them, you realize there's only one thing you can do now. There is no turning back. There's no place in the slums that will be safe. Your home and everything here that you cared about has been destroyed. Even going back from Arlene would only put the child in more danger. It's time to leave Midgar. The party climbs down just outside the walls of the city and they make their way out into the world. Cloud is determined to chase down and find Sephiroth. Nanaki agrees to come with you until you reach his home, but says that's as far as he wants to go. With that, the party heads out into the world, making their way to a village known as Kong. And once you're on the outside world map, you realize that Midgar is only a tiny blip on this planet. You can also see that the land around Midgar is devoid of vegetation, turning black as you get close to the city. This just shows that it's absolutely slowly killing the planet. Even the earth itself near Midgar looks black and charred devoid of anything even remotely resembling life. Once you get your bearings on the world map, you'll see a small village and there's really nothing else of interest. There's nothing for you to do at the moment except for to head to Calm. This place is a stark contrast to Midgar. It looks almost like something out of a classic fantasy world with only subtle nods to the world that you're currently in. Now, in the grand scheme of things in this game, Calm serves as nothing but a footnote. Nothing exciting happens here, but this is where some of the most important lore of the game is dumped right into your lap. Calm is where you first learn of the Nibelheim incident. The story here begins with Cloud in a truck with Sephiroth and a few other senior soldiers. Cloud is thrilled to be on a mission with his childhood hero and he can't contain himself. But it doesn't take long before the game reminds you of the power gap as the two of them have to take on a dragon that's blocking the path, giving the player a first hand view of Sephiroth's raw power as he just shreds this dragon with ease. Then they arrive at Nibelheim, Cloud's hometown. They're there to inspect the reactor in the mountains above the town, and they're accompanied by Tifa as a guide. The trip is rough, and when they get to the reactor, something is wrong. This is no ordinary reactor. There are pods full of experiments, thanks to Professor Hojo, as well as a door at the top that has the name of Sephiroth's mother, Genova, on it. Sephiroth is completely disgusted by what they discovered. And when I first played through this, I wasn't sure exactly what was happening, but I knew that it was something serious. The story then moves ahead to Cloud and Sephiroth staying at the old Shinra mansion. Sephiroth has taken up residence in the basement, obsessively reading the notes left by the Shinra scientists about Genova and the ancients. Eventually, Cloud goes to confront Sephiroth, getting a feeling that something is very wrong. Sephiroth tells Cloud that he is an ancient, and that he is destined to rule, and he's going to see his mother. Cloud then leaves the mansion to find that Nibelheim is engulfed in flames. He tries to save who he can, but it's no use. 
he sees Sephiroth as the monster that he has become, walking away from the destruction that he caused. The story then moves ahead where we find Sephiroth has murdered Tifa's father. Tifa then takes Sephiroth's sword and attempts to avenge him, but is wounded badly. Sephiroth breaks into the Genova chamber before Cloud rushes in to confront him. And then, well, the story's over. Cloud can't remember what happened next, leaving the party confused and frustrated. But Tifa seems very upset, which is understandable considering that she was getting to relive the destruction of her town and the death of her father. Once that story is over, you can hang around calm, but there's really nothing left to do except for to move on with your journey. Cloud and the party will eventually come across a chocobo farm, and you can stop or keep going. But if you pass it up, you'll end up in the swamps facing the Midgar Zalem, a massive snake that guards the swamp and will relentlessly chase anyone down who tries to enter it. So shy of spending hours grinding, you're almost certainly not going to defeat this serpent. So you really have no choice but to go back to the Chocobo farm. Once there, Chocobo Bill and Chocobo Billy will help you to learn how to catch a Chocobo, which will allow you to get past the Zolom and into the Mithril Mines. But not before giving you a very real example of the massive power gap between yourself and Sephiroth. When I first entered these mines, I felt like it was going to be something massive and special, but you get through them really fast and with relative ease before being confronted by the Turks. The first real reminder that Shinra is still around. They tell you that they are chasing after Sephiroth as well, and you end up moving on. From here, the world opens up a little bit more. You can travel to Fort Condor and take part in a mini game, but on my latest playthrough, I just moved on and rushed to Junin, wanting to get back to the story. Junin is where the story finally picks back up. After leaving Midgar, we got a big lore dump of the Nibelheim incident, but really the pace of the game drops to almost a crawl for a little bit after leaving Midgar. Up until then, everything had been a blur of action and drama. You blow up a reactor right out of the gate, then go to blow a second reactor the very next day, only to fall to what should be your death. Then you get the dress as a woman to save Tifa, barely survive the plate being dropped on Sector 7, infiltrate Shinra headquarters to save Eris. The president is assassinated by Sephiroth and you are chased out of Midgar. That's a lot for a very short period of time. The first time I played through this game, I felt like things were at a crawl after leaving Calm, and it was so boring. But as I played through it countless times over the years since, I realized that this time is really important. It's a chance to breathe to get that classic RPG feeling that Final Fantasy is known for. The world isn't just Midgar. It's so much more. This world isn't completely devoid of life, just the places touched by Shinra. The world of Final Fantasy VII is beautiful and alive, and so fragile. Everywhere Shinra goes, they leave scars on the planet. But this planet is still fighting, and more importantly, it's still something worth fighting for. Once you get to Junin, memories of Midgar start creeping back. It's another village turned into a glorified slum, literally under Shinra. The party needs to get to Junin proper, and after heading to the beach and saving a young girl, you get to ride a dolphin to the upper level. A fun reminder that this truly is a fantasy game and anything can happen. But the lower level is dark, the sun hidden by Shinra's city and the military stronghold above. There's a massive cannon, the Sister Ray, that you'll eventually learn is trained on Wutai, a once powerful rival nation to Shinra that's been crushed under their boots like everyone else who has opposed the corporate. Up on the top, Cloud ends up pulled into participating in a parade held in honor of new president, Rufus Shinra. 
after the parade is over, Cloud is able to do some minor exploration of the city, which gives more of a glimpse into what life on the top plates of Midgar is probably like than anything that you got to actually experience during your time in Midgar. The city is oppressive. The people live in cramped quarters and seem to be no happier than those forced to live below the city. After you have some time to explore this shining beacon of Shinra's superiority, you get to board a ship heading across the ocean. And once you're on board, you find out that the rest of the party has snuck on all in costumes to blend in. The best of which is a toss-up between either Red in his soldier gear or Sailor Barrett. The two both adding some much needed levity to the situation. Now the ship is carrying the president and his general Heidegger, and just as Barrett's planning to attack them, sirens go off. The party, worried that they may have been caught, I wonder how, regroup and realize that the issue is actually something far more worrisome. Cloud heads below deck and finds several of the crew dead and Sephiroth waiting for him. Before the two can have a proper confrontation, Sephiroth flees, leaving a piece of Genova behind to face the party. The battle's tough, but once it's over, the journey continues across the ocean, docking at the resort city, Costa del Sol. It often feels like Costa del Sol was placed here specifically to make you forget about the oppressive metropolis of Midgar. The colors are so vibrant here, it makes it hard to imagine this world is dying and the spirits are lifted even higher as Cloud and Co. get to spend a little bit of time here, making their way around the town and enjoying the sights. The only real critique I have for Costa del Sol is that there's just not a lot to do here. I'd love to stay in this place a little bit longer and explore. It's so happy and vibrant. But words like happy are fleeting in this world, as we see when we reluctantly continue to travel, heading through the mountains to Corral. beautiful beach and colors quickly fade as you head along the old train tracks that are in disrepair until you reach the true slums of the planet. Corel makes the slums of Midgar seem like a paradise. The buildings are barely standing. Several people live in tents. Everybody's miserable and everyone here hates Barrett. This is where you first to learn more about his story. Now, we know that Barrett is willing to fight to save the planet. We know he's willing to do terrible things if it means saving the world. We also know that Barrett hates Shinra. But here's where we truly learn why. The people here hate Barrett in his hometown and want nothing to do with him. His mood has changed as he acts defeated before the party leaves Corel and goes up to the sky to visit the Final Fantasy VII version of Disney. The Gold Saucer. Once you get there, Barrett takes off from the party, leaving Cloud and the others to explore. As they do, Cloud is stopped by a fortune teller called Kate Sith, who offers to read his fortune, doing a very bad job of it before declaring that he's going to join the party. And that's that. He's in. I wish there was more to say here, but that's really how it happens. But then just as things hit another more lighthearted high with this newest party member, you head to Battle Square. There you find several people who have been killed, all shot by a man with a gun on his arm. The party is captured, having entered the park alongside Barrett, and they're sent to Corel Prison, the lower level of what was once the village of Corel. And if Northern Corel was depressing, Corel Prison was utter despair. You eventually catch up to Barrett, and he tells you his story. Corel was a mining town. Coal was the very lifeblood of the community. But Shinra came in and offered to build a Maka reactor, promising a better life for everybody. Barrett and his best friend Dine were influential leaders in the town, and Dine was against the reactor, but Barrett actually supported it. 
He didn't know then about the damage that Mako reactors were doing to destroy the planet. He didn't know about the evil of Shinra. But the idea of a better life had him excited. He convinced Dine, and the reactor was built. But shortly after, there was an attack on the reactor while Dine and Barrett were out of town. They returned to see that Shinra had blamed Corel and retaliated against the people. Dine and Barrett rushed to get back, but were ambushed by Scarlet and Shinra troops. This is where we see the incident that took Barrett's hand. Barrett was just trying to provide a better life for his people, and they were ruined by it. He believed that Dime was dead. He hates Shinra because of what they've done to him and his town, and is driven by revenge. I didn't want to get into too much personal talk when I started this video, but the whole story with Barrett really resonates with me. I'm from Southeast Ohio, living on the river across from West Virginia. I've been through the Appalachian coal communities. My own home was a coal community back in the day. We've seen what happens here when progress leaves some behind. I fully support progress in making things better, but I can relate to the depression that comes from seeing a community die. It's not easy and people cling to what they know. Still, there's communities here that are desperate for the mines to open back up. I wondered growing up why more people from Appalachia didn't just move away, but as Barrett stated earlier, maybe it's just that they love their land. And now living here as an adult, I get that. After telling his story, Barrett and the party take off to the desert to confront Dine. That's where we learn that Barrett's daughter Marlene is actually Dine's biological daughter. Dine has given up, even suggesting that he should take Marlene to be with her mother, who died in the attack on Corel. Barrett has clung to hope where Dine lost his. Dine asked Barrett to take care of Marlene before falling to his death, leaving Barrett crushed as he struggles to come to terms with what just happened. The party manages to earn their freedom, but even as the mood of the game picks back up, it leaves us with that sting of what the party have just been through. And as we're still coming to terms with it, with seeing a more human side of Barrett, we have to move on. But from here on out, Barrett does seem more mature. He's come to terms with his past. Well, as much as he can for now at least. And he's putting his life into perspective a bit more. He wants to fight to protect what he loves. The party is then given a buggy that allows them to cross rivers and the desert, and they continue their pursuit of Sephiroth. As you travel, you'll come across what looks like a wreckage in the middle of a small forest. This place is optional for now, but the drive for exploration is strong. When you get there, you'll see that Reno and Rude are having a conversation and you get a chance to eavesdrop. Finding out even more about them as Rude confesses that he has a crush on Tifa. Even the Turks have more depth than just bad guys. Eventually they realize that you're there and you have a short battle before they retreat. You can then travel to a ruined reactor and find a powerful summon material, Titan, inside. You then have to hide as Shinra executives Scarlet and Heidegar arrive, learning that they're in search for something called huge material. Here in the forest is more than just a ruined reactor. You can also visit a town that's despair rivals Corral, the village of Gungaga. Here, you learn about Eris' first boyfriend, Zack, another member of Soldier, and another first-class soldier. Yet Cloud has no recollection of him. After meeting Zack's parents, Tifa and Eris both end up rather upset with Cloud, 
who doesn't seem to realize just how badly he messed up. The party doesn't really need to stick around here though, as there's really nothing to do but speak with the villagers and hear their sad stories. Shortly after passing Gangaga, the buggy that you'd recently received breaks down just outside of Cosmo Canyon. This is the home of Nanaki, or Red 13. Once you get there, he runs off, excited to finally be home. The party splits up to explore the canyon, a place for researchers and lovers of nature. Eventually, you climb to the upper levels and meet Buchenhagen, a man Nanaki calls his grandfather. After the party heads back, they gather around the fire. There, Cloud can have some conversations with everyone. Barrett has had time to think about the events of Corel, and has decided to go ahead and continue the fight. The Avalanche will be reborn, and that they will save the planet. Tifa is distant, as she really has a bad feeling about the way things are going, and feels like things are on the brink of collapse, but she won't open up about it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Nanaki is Red 13's real name, even though he doesn't really care for it. And here's where we finally realize why. We discover here that Nanaki's parents were defenders of Cosmo Canyon and were at war with the Gi tribe. Red tells that his father had fled like a coward, leaving his mother to defend the canyon alone. But as it turns out, Nanaki is an unreliable narrator. He grew up believing this and has let this story drive him to be ashamed of who he is, and ashamed of his father, Seto. Bugahagen finally realizes why Nanaki feels this way and decides that it's time for the truth. Bugahagen takes Nanaki and two other party members into the Forbidden Canyon, where the ghosts of the Gi tribe are restless, unable to return to the planet. After defeating the leader of the Gi tribe in a boss fight that can be extremely challenging or extremely simple once you realize that healing items hurt undead, which means an X potion gives full health can in turn also deal full life damage. But from here, Bugenhagen introduces Nanaki to Seto, who was turned to stone by the Gi tribe as he took a final stand, staying there alone to stop them and save the people of the canyon. Nanaki then realizes that his story was wrong, that his father was no coward but a hero who gave his life to keep his family and his people safe. The stone Seto begins to weep in a touching moment where despite his state, his spirit connects with his son and the two share a few precious moments. The years of pain and feelings of betrayal finally being washed away. The party prepares to leave, Nanaki comes back and declares that he cannot leave his friends behind. He's emboldened by his father's sacrifice and vows to commit himself to saving the planet, rejoining the party with newfound conviction. Now that the buggy is repaired and operational, the party continues on until they reach an impassable body of water and perilous mountains. Now there's nowhere else to go except Nibelheim. Once you arrive, you realize something is immediately wrong. This village looks the same, if not even better than it did five years ago. But Tifa and Cloud remember it. The village was completely destroyed. Everyone there was killed. They can ask the villagers about it, but they all deny any destruction and get irritable when pressed for the truth, leaving Cloud and Tifa very upset unable to figure out just what's going on. Though it does eventually become evident that Shinra had Nibelheim rebuilt and populated to cover up what really happened five years ago. It's jarring to go into Cloud's childhood home and the person there not be his mother, but instead someone who doesn't even know him. Even Tifa's home was the same as we saw it before, but it was completely wrong. You can just continue through this village and up into the mountains, but the story pushes you to go and visit the Shinra Mansion. 
where there's a puzzle that you can solve to get a basement key as well as a powerful boss fight against a creature that I've suffered many times too over the years. Once you get to the basement, you can use the key to open a door that was locked in the flashback, and it's here that you finally get to meet Vincent Valentine. Vincent lets you know that he used to be a Turk, but was betrayed and put himself into a deep slumber here in the bowels of the mansion as penance for his sins. Eventually, you'll head to the lab where you run back into Sephiroth. He has the same sinister vibe he gave five years ago and tells you his next destination before escaping. As you leave to pursue him, Vincent will stop you and agree to join the party, giving you one of the most popular characters from the series. It's just a shame that Vincent is fully optional, as the game does not do him justice in giving him his share of story development. Vincent was a member of the Turks before Sephiroth was born, and was in love with Sephiroth's real mother, Lucretia. But she was devoted to her research, being a scientist for Shinra. And she was with Hojo, the head of the Shinra Science Department. Hojo injected Lucretia and Sephiroth with Genova cells while he was still in the womb, and when Vincent went to confront Hojo, he was shot and then tested on, resulting in him having horrific mutations and leading to the self-induced exile from the world. After you leave the mansion, the party makes their way through the perilous Mount Nebel, and you can revisit the reactor but there's not much point in that for now. Once you get through the mountains, you open back up to the world map, and this is where I first met our next optional character. Yuffie Kisaragi, the Materia Hunter. Now you can encounter and recruit her before you even reach Junon, but I've never really tried to pick her up too early. You encounter her in combat, and after defeating her, you have to get through a whole lot of dialogue right off the bat before you can get her to join. Yuffie is younger than the rest of the party, a thief from Wutai searching for materia to gain power so that she can help her people go back to war with Shinra. She's naive, she's full of herself, but she seems to have a good heart. We'll learn more about her in due time, but for now, we have to continue on to Rocket Town. I often wondered what this village was called before the space program, or if it was just constructed for this very purpose. The village stands out due to its large rocket that's tilted and slowly creeping to fall over, a relic of a different time in the history of Shinra. It's here that you meet Sid Highwind, the respected and gruff Shinra pilot, whom the Shinra's epic airship was named after, and a man who would have been the first to enter space. Sid is worked up, having received news that Rufus was coming to meet with him, in hopes that Shinra was finally going to open the space program back up. Cloud and the party explore the town and meet with Shara, who lives with Sid as his assistant, despite Sid being rather hateful towards her. We come to learn that years before, Shira was a scientist working on the space program. The day they were scheduled to finally launch, Sid was made aware at the last minute that Shira was still on board, down in the engine room running tests. She was convinced that one of the oxygen tanks had malfunctioned and was refusing to get off the ship. The launch itself would have burned Shira alive from the heat of the engine, leading Sid to cancel the launch just as it was about to take off, which left the rocket in its current state. Shinra, being the goldfish of an organization that it is, became distracted by a new venture and put the space program on hold, leaving Sid and the people of Rocket Town in a state of limbo, waiting for the day that they might finally get to realize their dream. Sid has held a grudge against Shira ever since, and Shira, feeling guilt for ruining Sid's dream, has just accepted the abuse, convincing herself that she deserves it. 
as his hopes are dashed when Rufus tells him that he's only in the city as the commandeer Sid's plane, the tiny Bronco. As Sid is arguing with President Rufus, Cloud and the gang head to the back of the house where Palmer, the incompetent head of the Shinra space program, is trying to figure out how to steal the small plane. The group dispatches Palmer, who sits the plane to take off in his ignorance, leaving the party to jump on as it's launching. Sid hops on as well as Shinra open fire and they attempt to flee. The tiny Bronco ends up damaged in the escape, turning the small plane into an awkward yet somewhat functional boat or raft of sorts. Sid, in his despair and frustration, decides to throw in with the party enjoyment. And now, the party ends up getting a chance to explore the world to a greater degree. Bronco can essentially cover most of the world, but what's more intriguing than where you can go are all the places that you can see that you still can't reach. It's just pieces of things to come and places that you've yet to find a way to get to, and it just makes the desire for exploration grow tenfold. Eventually, your travels and exploration will take you to a new location in the north, the Bone Village, a location that's full of archaeologists. Now you'll find from them that a man in black is trying to get into the Temple of the Ancients, but he needs an item called the Keystone. There's nothing else really here for now, so after a while, all you have to do is to go search for this Keystone. It'll eventually lead you to a weapon vendor south of Corel, who tells you that he had the Keystone, but he sold it to Dio, the owner of the Gold Saucer. So back up through Corel to pay Dio a visit. He surprisingly agrees to give you the keystone if you participate in the battle. After you get through the battles, no matter how well you do, Dio will reward you with the keystone. But you quickly find out that the gondola is out of order, meaning you have to stay the night with the gold saucer. This is where a key moment of the game's story takes place. Depending on how you've acted towards the party during the game thus far, you end up going on a date with one of the members. And in the case of this playthrough, just as I did in my very first time with the game, Cloud goes on a date with Eris. It starts out simple enough. She wants to go see a play, and who would have guessed? Tonight, they pull two members of the audience up to be the starring roles. Now, you can make different choices here, but they really don't matter much. The next stop is the Skylift, where you go through a tour of the entire complex, complete with fireworks. This is a one-on-one -on -one moment where Eris opens up the cloud. Here you can see how their relationship has grown. They care deeply for one another, and the maturity of Eris shows wisdom beyond her years. A really sweet day is brought to an abrupt halt when you run into Kate Sif, seeing that he has stolen the keystone. After a short chase through the saucer, Kate Sif gives the stone to Shinra, officially outing himself as a spy. Cloud and Eris are powerless to do anything to him, as he lets them hear Marlene's voice, making them aware that this lovable and annoying cat's controller had kidnapped Barrett's daughter and was holding her hostage halfway across the world in Midgar. This is a no-win situation. You have to allow Kate Sith to stick in the party, and you can't tell anybody what he's done. The next morning, you can depart and head to the Temple of the Ancients. Eris is mandatory here as she is a Cetra, or an Ancient. As soon as you arrive, Eris is overwhelmed by the location, hearing the voice of the planet. A 
As soon as you reach the entrance, you see Singh, the leader of the Turks. But he's badly wounded, thanks to Sephiroth. And speaks a few kind words to Eris, whom he'd been in close proximity to since she was a child, as Shinra has always kept tabs on her due to her bloodline. The temple is a labyrinth filled with dangerous enemies, puzzles, and the spirits of the ancients who remain there to guard this temple from evil. After a handful of puzzles, like trying to get to a hallway full of rolling stones and a moving clock that leads to 12 different rooms, you'll find the central chamber where you encounter Sephiroth, and he explains his master plan. Sephiroth intends to use the Black Materia, the most powerful destructive materia on the planet, to summon Meteor which is capable of destroying the planet itself. His goal here is to move to the center of the planet, explaining that the planet will attempt to heal itself, sending all of its energy to the source of the impact, where he intends to take the energy of the life stream into himself to become a god. The soldier of legend, a man who Cloud had idolized, had slipped completely into madness and wants to destroy the planet and everyone, and everything on it in order to ascend, and this is where things take a much darker turn. Cloud begins to laugh and shake, echoing the words of Sephiroth, who is trying and succeeding to toy with Cloud's mind, but the party manages to snap him out of it. They learn that the temple itself is the Black Materia, and in order to make it small enough to wield it, you must be crushed to death inside of it. Now this would be a pretty good stalemate, if not for all of the black-robed men who Sephiroth has been manipulating throughout this entire game. You meet the first of these men way back in Midgar, a man who was sick in the slums. You've ran into them throughout the world, especially in Nibelheim. So the party realizes that if they leave it here, Sephiroth would gladly send one of them into their deaths to secure that material for himself. So you have to make a really tough choice. Thankfully, it's about to be made a lot easier. Kate Sith calls in. Now, I have no idea what he would do if he was actually in the party. I never use him in my party, and I'm sure nobody else does either. But he points out that his body is a puppet, and that he'll be willing to sacrifice it in an attempt to atone for spying on the party and kidnapping a child. Not exactly a fair trade, but you don't have a lot of options here. Kate Sith says his goodbyes and tries hard to create an emotional moment. But no matter how many times I've tried to look at this, this is a man who betrayed the party, sending his puppet, his toy, into the broken. Not a noble sacrifice, and shortly after this, he just arrives as a new and identical Kate Sith. But now you have the Black Materia, and Sephiroth of course shows up, asking Cloud to give it to him. and Cloud loses his mind again, surrendering it to Sephiroth and then starts struggling, thrashing as he's fighting for his mind, leading him to attack Eris before being pulled off of her and blacking out. A truly shocking moment where you see just how dangerous Sephiroth can be, and you see Cloud's mental state crumbling under the pressure of the mission and the oppressive power of Sephiroth. Cloud, in a dream sequence, meets Eris in a forest. She tells him that she knows what has to be done and that she has to do this alone. She alone can take down Sephiroth and save the planet. She's going to the City of the Ancients. As Eris departs, Cloud tries to chase after her but he can't move. And then a sad dream turns to a nightmare as Sephiroth shows up and thanks Cloud before declaring that Eris must be dealt with. Cloud wakes up in Gungaga, taken there by the party after passing out, and here, we don't see Cloud, the strong soldier, 
Trout confesses he's scared. He says he shouldn't continue on this journey because he doesn't trust himself. Before adding that despite that, he has no choice. Cloud is on this train and there's no getting off. The planet is at stake. He alone knows where Eris is and knows that she's in grave danger. Now before we go any further through the story, it's time to look at one of the side quests that you can take once you get the tiny Bronco. As we discussed earlier, Yuffie is a side character, and if you happen to have her in your party, taking a stop at the island to the east is a really good idea to go ahead with before you move forward in the game. If you've already recruited Yuffie at this point, then shortly after arriving on the island, she will betray the party and steal your materia. You've got no choice now. If you want it back, you have to travel the rest of the way across the island to Wutai, Yuki's hometown. She's hiding there, and as you search for her, you'll wind up eventually running into the Turks, who tell you that they're on their vacation, and they really don't care about fighting you, much to the dismay of Elena. On your search, you'll come to learn that Yuffie is bitter toward Shinra because of the treatment of her people. With the once powerful nation now forced into becoming a tourist attraction. And her hope is that in stealing your materia, she'll eventually be able to use that to help her people fight back against Shinra. And that Wutai may eventually rise back to being a proud nation once again. After learning more of her situation and coming to understand why she betrayed you, she will eventually slip away, but ends up getting herself captured, alongside Elena, by Don Corneo. The creep of Wall Market is back and searching for a new bride. Reno and Rude agree to a ceasefire as you all search Wutai to try to find them. It's not hard to feel sorry for Yuffie here. She did betray you. But, she didn't kidnap a child, I mean, she has real reasons. She's a child herself, just a teen who's determined to try to save her people from the oppression of Shinra. She traveled across the world in search of what she thought she needed in order to fight this oppression and take down this company turned into a world government. Despite the betrayal, we know that Yuffie isn't the bad guy here. The search for Yuffie and Elena will eventually lead you up into the mountains over a massive statue that's carved right into the stone. And there, you'll find the women and Don Corneo. Now this will lead to a relatively simple boss fight, and then the Don threatens to kill the women before being taken out by the Turks. sad end to a sad creep. This bit also shows that Shinra isn't strictly evil one-note bad guys. As we said before, the Turks, they were willing to put their issues aside to save one of their own. And now that we're through this fun, albeit short, side venture, now we have to head back to the Bone Village. Once you make your way back to the Bone Village, you'll have to do some minor excavation work and search for an item called the Lunar Harp. Now, this is an instrument that will help you to navigate the Sleeping Forest. Without the harp, entering the forest will result in endless traveling and in nothing more than getting lost and running around in circles. Once you use the harp, you can get through the forest, which you realize is the same place that you met with Eris earlier. And from there, you make your way into the lost city of the ancients. This place is a ruin, showing off what was a primitive society, yet you can tell that there was beauty in the old world of the Cetra. 
After some exploration, you find what seems to be some sort of cathedral. One of the most beautiful places that you'll come across this far in the entire game. As you head closer, Cloud encounters Eris. She had traveled here alone, knowing what she had to do as the last remaining Cetra, kneeling there in prayer, speaking with the planet. At this point, Cloud steps away from the party to go to Eris, still feeling the guilt from his attack on her back at the Temple of the Ancients. Now as Cloud gets close, his mind falls under attack from Sephiroth again. And at this point, every button you press, every decision Cloud makes, leads him closer and closer to attacking Eris. There's this true sense of horror when you realize that everything you do brings you closer to dropping the sword down on her. And just as Cloud is about to swing, the party screams at him, and he barely comes to his senses in time, taking a step back before Eris finally looks up at him, finally seeming to be aware that he's there as she was so busy praying. Eris smiles up at Cloud, a look of knowing, a look of hope, as she sees that he has come there for her. There's no fear in her eyes. Just as the hope begins to well up again, Sephiroth drops from the sky and murders Eris. draws his blade back from her and Eris collapses in the cloud's arms. The white materia that had been in her hair falls free. And drops into the life stream. Each bounce down the pillar steps, feeling like time ticking away as you're helpless to do anything but watch. This world has been full of sadness and pain up to this point, but here, Eris has been with you from the start. She was special. Of all the party members, Eris was a standout, and now she was gone. Cloud cradles her lifeless body as Sephiroth starts to monologue, and Cloud starts shouting for him to just shut up. His body is trembling, holding her close. Eris was full of hope, a true white mage whose role was to hold the party together. Her presence was soothing and it was a healing presence in combat in a very practical way for the entire journey. All these characters you know, can use the materia and everything, you can customize the party to your needs, but Eris was the only one that was that true healer. No matter how many countless times that I've played through this game, this scene always brings tears to my eyes. And it has since become one of the most well-known and impactful moments in gaming history. To compound the pain that's happening here, the party isn't given any time to react before Sephiroth leaves again and drops another piece of Genova for them to battle. But this boss feels different. The music doesn't change. That hopeless feeling, that hole that you can feel in the party is lingering and dominating this entire battle. The battle itself winds up becoming a blur that you just really don't even remember in the scheme of this entire situation. Once you get through it, party each come up one by one to comfort Cloud and have their own goodbyes with Eris before Cloud picks her up and carries her down to the pool and lowers Eris down, allowing her to sink down and return to the life stream.
After this, the party regroups in the city of the ancients, and they decide that they must push through. They can't allow her death to be the end. Eris can't have died in vain. They have to fight on. Now this is the end of the first disc. The cliffhanger that has left countless players feeling empty and defeated. By the time you reach this point in most games, you're already at the end. And here, you've only finished the first of three discs. This story is far from over. After Eris' death, the party decides to continue to pursue Sephiroth. Now this leads them through the frozen lands of the northern continent. You scale cliffs and make your way through, this cold environment being such a fitting setting given the cold emptiness that everyone's feeling, still reeling from that death and from the loss. Eventually, as you make your way through the snow, You'll reach a small village that's completely covered in snow and aptly named the Icicle Inn. Now, there's only a few houses here in this inhospitable land, but the people here seem content. Now, you will run into the Turks again briefly, but this place holds a much deeper importance. If you explore the small town and enter the abandoned house, you'll find a collection of old home videos, and that's where you'll discover that this was the home of Professor Gast and Defano, Eris' parents. You'll see these videos showing the family growing together, showing how close they are right up until Hojo and Shinra find them, leading to Gast's murder and Defauna and Eris fleeing, which would eventually lead to Elmira finding them in Midgar. It is so hard to watch these videos as they tear that wound right back open before it's had time to even properly consider starting to heal. Every time I play through this portion of the game, I can't help but get angry. Eris should be here. She should be seeing these videos. This was her life. She should be here to see her family, to get these memories. But she's gone. A dull ache builds as I move on from the house, and no matter how many times I've played this game, and I have lost count at this point, but it never gets any easier. Mercifully, this game does add some levity as you prepare to leave the Icicle Inn. Because from here you have to make your way back down the mountain. And this time you do so on a snowboard. In one of the best mini games in Final Fantasy VII. Once you reach the bottom, you'll eventually find yourself landing in a frozen tundra. A totally inhospitable land that makes the cold that you've been through before feel like a day at Costa del Sol. Eventually, if you don't end up finding your way, as I sure didn't here, you pass out and you're rescued by an old man who has taken to guarding this area and assisting anyone crazy enough to try to tackle the mountain. Eventually, after warming up, you leave from his home, and you'll make your way up the climb to the top. Once you finally reach the peak, you make your way into the northern crater, where you can confront Sephiroth and end things. Looking back, I can remember on my very first playthrough the feeling when I topped that cliff to see the crater, realizing just how close I was to finally getting to confront Sephiroth. I forgot that I had only just recently put in the second disc. I'd forgotten that there was clearly much more ahead. This felt like the big showdown. It was so intense. 
My heart was pounding as I tried to emotionally prepare. I was still so angry at this evil bastard for taking Eris away. I was distraught and I was determined to bring an end to this nightmare. Now, as you travel deeper into the crater, your party sees tons of the rogue men all making their way there for the reunion. Cloud eventually ends up recovering the black materia after facing another part of Genova and smartly hands it off to another party member to keep it safe, still not fully trusting himself. Cloud ends up confronting Sephiroth alongside Tifa, who seems unusually scared here, trying to get Cloud to just ignore him. Sephiroth insists that Cloud has been lying this whole time and that he's just a puppet, taking them back to a memory of Nibelheim from five years ago, letting them see the flames and everything again. Well, the key moment of this comes when a picture is presented to Cloud. It's a picture that they took five years ago. And this is where we see a black-haired soldier, but not Cloud. This leads to Cloud starting to question everything. How he joined Soldier, the entire history after he left for Nibelheim. Everything comes to a head, and he seems to start to accept that he maybe is indeed a puppet. Eventually, Cloud does end up reaching the center of the crater, where the leaders of Shinra are all gathered as well, thanks to the High Wind. At this point, Cloud snaps. His lost memories, leaving room for doubt and hopelessness, was able to cripple him. Did he pursue Sephiroth, or was he summoned by him? Was he a soldier, or just a failed experiment? Maybe Sephiroth was telling the truth. Cloud surrenders to his grief, giving the Black Materia to Sephiroth, who immediately summons Meteor. Just in that moment, the earth starts to shake as giant monsters awaken from the crater. Creatures known as Weapon, defenders of the planet created by the planet. At this point, everything goes to hell, and the party end up fleeing with Shinra on the high wind as the life stream erupts in the crater. The game picks back up in June, with Cloud missing and the rest of Avalanche has been captured with preparations in place for their execution. Tifa and Barrett see Meteor in the sky. This world seems doomed. Tifa winds up put into a gas chamber by Scarlet, and just as things are about to really end for Tifa, Sapphire Weapon attacks Junin, giving the party the opening to rescue Tifa and escape. Stealing the high wind. And at this point, thankfully, Tifa finally gets a small measure of revenge on Scarlet before making her escape. With everyone except Cloud regrouped now, the party has free reign to travel the entire world. Piloting the high wind is a blast and makes revisiting the earlier locations so much easier. Now the party's in search of Cloud, desperately hoping that maybe, just maybe, somehow he's still alive. Eventually the search for Cloud leads you down south 
to a small oasis town known as Medeal. They hear word of a young man who had washed up from the live stream, and Tifa rushes to the doctor's clinic where they find Cloud. But something's wrong. The exposure to the pure Mako, or live stream, has led to severe Mako poisoning. His mind is miles away as he's trapped within himself, even less functional than the robed men who are being drawn to the crater. At this point, Tifa tells the party that she's going to stand with Cloud, leaving Sid in charge. Now we're down three party members in very short order, and if you're like me, it's the three that you primarily used for the first portion of the game, and now they're all gone. The feeling of depression and sadness was overwhelming the first time I played through the game, and in subsequent playthroughs, with the obvious exception of this one, I tend to at least leave Eris out of my party, just because it's so painful to lose her after having her active in the entire game. Not to mention that you're investing all this time into developing a character just to lose them. For this playthrough, I wanted to keep as close to what I originally experienced all those years ago as a teen as possible. Sid ends up finding out through Kate Sith that Shinra is going to all the different reactors to capture huge materia, which are massive chunks of materia created within the reactors with the hope of launching it up at Meteor to try and destroy it. But in doing so, it's taking a ton of the planet's life essence and just throwing it up into space, a loss that they just can't let happen. Sid takes the party to Fort Condor, where you take on a mini-game. Here, you're paying for mercenaries to help fend off Shinra troops, as their plan is to get that huge materia, which would really compromise the safety and well-being of the giant condor that has perched on top of the reactor and made it its home. Now, after you've saved the condor, its egg hatches, and the mother dies. Then the baby ends up taking off, making you feel powerless again. I mean, you fought to save the bird, and it still ended up passing away. But at, at least the baby was okay. Fort Condor is one of those areas in the game that really feels underdeveloped, but the, the minigame is enjoyable, so I mean, it's not a total loss, and now that you've managed to save one piece of the huge materia, the next stop is the Corel Reactor. Now once you get there, you're actually a little bit too late. Shinra's already taken off with the huge materia and loaded it into a train. The party has no choice but to board another train and chase them down. After taking out the troops on that train, Sid has to find a way to stop it as it's barreling towards the remains of Corel. And if it crashes, it's going to even further wreck and already demoralize people in that mining community. Fortunately, after a bit of luck and a very scary moment where it feels like the train's going faster, at least on this playthrough, Sid managed to stop the train and secure the huge materia. It is entirely possible, however, to fail, and the train will just wipe out what's left of Corel, just compounding the misery of the people who live there. Now they put this in the hands of the player, which adds a lot of tension, because if you fail, it's your fault, which just makes this a narrative point that adds even more relief when you actually do pull it off. And if you fail to stop the train, the guilt is your weight to carry. But for now, we've recovered the huge materia, we've saved Corel from the train, and at this point, the party asks Sid about going back to check on Cloud and Tifa. At this point, the party heads back to Medeal to see just what's going on with the comrades, but things fall apart as Ultimate Weapon ends up attacking the small village as soon as you get there. Everybody's in a panic, 
running for cover as the ground begins to shake. Sid tells Tifa to stay with Cloud, and he and the rest of the party try to defend the village against Weapon. This battle is punishing, but eventually you manage to defeat Weapon, and even then, things aren't over. Sid and the group have no choice but to retreat to the high wind as the ground starts to shake for a massive earthquake. At this point, Sid just hopes that Tifa is able to make it out in one piece. The game then cuts back to Tifa in the hospital with Cloud. She knows that she can't just stay there, so she takes Cloud outside in his wheelchair. Here, we get a wild cutscene of these two desperately trying to flee as the ground is crumbling around them. And just as they're reaching the village entrance, the two are swallowed up by the planet and washed away into the life stream. This is the point where we reach one of many massively emotional climaxes in this game. There's been so much that has built up to this moment. Tifa wakes up in what appears to be Cloud's memories. At this point, Cloud is a wreck. His mind is fractured. Everything that he has been through on this journey so far has left him doubting his very existence. Tifa is approached by a young Cloud as she has to try and help him to understand the truth and what's really going on and who he is. In the beginning of this video, I mentioned briefly that this is a story of unreliable narrators. Here is where it all comes together. It's here where we realize the truth and learn what's really been going on. So I'm going to break this section down differently than I had from so much up until now. Right after leaving Midgar, Cloud told us about his experience in Nibelheim, when Sephiroth lost his mind and destroyed the town. Tifa seemed uneasy by the end, and now we learn why. Cloud's story did not align with Tifa's recollection of the events. Tifa finally confesses to Cloud that he wasn't there. He knew details that he had no business knowing about what happened, but she knew one thing. Tifa never saw Cloud five years ago. She hadn't seen him in seven years since he had left to go to Midgard to join Soldier in the first place. Back when I first played through this game as a kid, I wondered why Tifa didn't say anything sooner. But as we've seen her growing closer to Cloud, and now that I'm getting a little bit older, I'm starting to think that this makes a little more sense. Tifa has lost everything. Her parents, her hometown, and even her home in Midgar. Her friends were killed. All she really has left to cling to from her past, from her entire life up to this point, is Cloud. She was afraid that if she told him the truth, it could cause him pain or worse, that he would end up leaving and she would truly be alone again. Tifa served as an unreliable narrator by omission. She knew that things weren't adding up. The story didn't match up with what she remembered because he wasn't even there. But she was afraid to really face the situation, hoping that maybe there was some confusion there and that it would work itself out. Tifa goes back through the memories with Cloud, and they end up looking for a memory that means a lot to him. She guides him to look deep into himself for something to cling to, something to prove that he is the Cloud that she knew as a child, that he's the same Cloud that she grew up with. Cloud reluctantly exposes this memory. Here we see Tifa as a child, heading up to Mount Nibble after her mother passed away. She was convinced that she could find her mother if she went there. Several other kids, her friends, went with her, but as she went further up into the mountains, they one by one left her alone, yet Cloud followed her from a distance, refusing to let her go truly alone.
and when she was by herself and she lost her footing, Cloud rushed to her aid and ended up falling with her while trying to save her life. He ended up being blamed for the incident by her father, and it led Cloud to deciding that he wanted to join Soldier in the first place because he felt weak and helpless over not actually being able to save Tifa. It eventually came time to confront the Nibelheim incident. Cloud and Tifa both admitted that it was Zack in the photo with Tifa and Sephiroth. Cloud was not the soldier that went with Sephiroth. But in a deeply touching reveal, we learned that Cloud was there. Cloud never made it into soldier. He became a general troop for the Shinra army. When he went to Nibelheim, he was ashamed, still feeling weak, feeling like a failure, so he kept his military gear on to hide his face. The shame of his weakness, the guilt from failing to accomplish his goal, was the linchpin for everything that happened thus far. Cloud followed Tifa back through the mountains to confront Sephiroth after he destroyed the village. He saw that Tifa was wounded and he went to her. He had enough. His guilt, seeing the village destroyed, his hometown destroyed by his hero, was just too much to bear. Sephiroth, the man who Cloud had admired, who he looked to as a hero that led to him wanting to join a soldier in the first place, had taken everything from him. His hometown, Tifa, his mother, all gone. Cloud did face Sephiroth, and despite being badly wounded, Cloud was able to throw Sephiroth into the life stream. Cloud had been an unreliable narrator because his own guilt kept him from accepting his reality. His need to be the hero allowed him, in a vulnerable state, to don a persona that was who he wanted to be, when he was in truth something much more. Cloud was a hero. He was there for Tifa, and most importantly, he kept his promise. I was a young teen when I first played Final Fantasy VII. I was going through a very rough time in my life. I didn't know who I was, who I wanted to be. I didn't understand back then that I was suffering from depression. I knew that it was often easier to pretend to be something I wasn't. So playing through this game and being along for Cloud's story, taking that ride with him, I felt his pain. Seeing Cloud come to learn who he was made me want to learn who I am. I know a lot of people think games are just something fun, a way to kill some time, but this game was and is special. It helped me to find myself and to learn that it's okay to be awkward and afraid. Your heart's what matters. And if I were to describe this game in one word, it would have to be heart. Without Final Fantasy VII, I don't know who I'd be today. Without being able to go through Cloud's journey, I can't say that I'd be the same person I am now. After coming to terms with who he is with the help of his friend Tifa, Cloud and Tifa made their way through the life stream, being returned back to the world. We then jump ahead to the two being reunited with the rest of the party. Cloud apologizes to everybody for all that's happened. And they all easily, readily forgive him. They have a lot to worry about now though. Shinra is after one more piece of huge materia from an underwater reactor below Junin. The party departs and rushes right through Junin down to the reactor where they're intercepted by Reno who tells them that he's really just there to stall for time 
before sending another massive Shinra robot in to take on the party. It feels weird at this point in the game to be facing some of these mechanical creations of Shinra after you've contended with powerful creatures like Weapon. But I digress. You take out the robot pretty easily and then you end up finding out that the submarine with the material is already taken off and you have to go after it and shoot the submarine down. Even though I skimmed over this earlier, I've got to point it out here. When you commandeer the submarine, the crew that's on the sub are the same small crew that you run into when you first get to Junin when you have to go through the parade. And you don't realize this right off, but as soon as I learned that, I've always made a point to let them go rather than actually fighting them. Because it's just cool to see, you know, again, not everyone in Shinra is bad. Once the submarine business is settled, the party has to rush to Rocket Town, where Shinra is planning to send the rocket up after Meteor, even though you've taken a lot of the huge materia. Once you get to the rocket, Sid takes over the ship, and alongside the other people of Rocket Town, who were all part of the space program, Sid and the party are shot into space. This is it. Sid has finally achieved his dream. He looks out on the world, seeing how small it is from way up there. He's done it. Sid assures Cloud that there is an escape pod on the ship, but the first thing they have to do is they have to take care of the remaining huge material that's on this rocket. After you manage to get the materia free, you head to the escape pod, but as you're almost there, the oxygen tank erupts, covering Sid in a massive piece of shrapnel. Cheryl was right. The tank was faulty. Now just as Sid is ready to give up, telling Cloud to go on and leave him, Shara shows up and helps to free Sid. She had stuck around on the ship to help, still worried about that oxygen tank. She takes them to the escape pod and they get off the rocket shortly before it collides into the meteor, which sadly does nothing to stop it. But Sid realized now that he was wrong. He didn't just save Shara by canceling the launch. She saved his life when he had to cancel it those years ago. Here Sid realizes that all that anger and bitterness really meant nothing. It didn't accomplish anything because, in truth, the only people for him to really be mad at were Shinra for canceling the program. At this point, Sid seems to soften and mature. Eventually, they come back down to Earth and are returned to the high wind. At this point, the party has saved the huge materia. They've outsmarted Shinra, but they've reached a really weird place. Meteor is still looming. The northern crater has been made inaccessible thanks to a force field that Sephiroth has put up since they escaped earlier. They really don't have anything to do now and aren't sure what the next move should be, but they know they have to do something. So from here, they decide to take the huge materia to Bugenhagen, believing that if anybody knows how to keep it safe, it will be him. The party heads back to Cosmo Canyon, where they go to Bugenhagen's home, giving him the huge materia, and they begin to discuss the journey thus far, trying to figure out just what they're missing, what to do next. After the party do some soul searching, the decision is made to head back to the City of the Ancients, hoping that they may find a clue there. Eris had said that only she could stop Meteor, and that's where they went. Maybe they can find something, some clue to go on. Buchenhagen also asked to travel with them this time, and of course they agree. Once they reach the City of the Ancients, they make their way to the capital. This place is so mysterious, it's different from anything else in the game. 
Each time I go to explore the city, I'm just blown away by how incredible it looks. It makes me wish I could just play a game going back to the time when it was actually inhabited, you know, before Genova, to see what life was like here for the ancients, for the Cetra. Bugenhagen heads to the center platform in what looks to have been some sort of meeting place and tells Cloud that they need the key to the Ancients, which sends Cloud back out in search for the riddle. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't take too long to realize that the place where the sun can't reach must mean a cave, and the riddle eventually will lead you back down to the submarine and into an underwater cave. Once you get the key, you have to rush back to Bugenhagen, and from there you get to relive the heartbreaking scene with Eris. But this time, in the midst of the sadness, you get a glimmer, however brief, of hope. The white materia, holy. It had reacted to Eris. It was active. There was hope. But it had fallen into the life stream. And even now, after she was taken from us, Eris is still fighting. She's still helping the party and driving them forward. All hope is not lost just yet. But as you start to feel like there's a way to save the world, Kate Sith calls and lets you know that Rufus has moved the massive Mako cannon from Junin and has set it up in Midgar, where he intends to use a massive amount of Mako energy to fire at the barrier around the northern crater, as Shinra seems to have a plan to attack Sephiroth. The most powerful weapon that humanity has created, powered by multiple Mako reactors, all preparing to wage war against the calamity within the crater, hoping that if they can defeat the summoner, Meteor will go away. Now Scarlet has renamed the cannon to the Sister Ray as they're making their preparations, for whatever reason. I remember playing through this when I was younger, and even now, getting that feeling that despite their evil ways, this is actually a good idea. I mean, something had to be done, and there weren't a lot of options. I still wanted Sephiroth to be paid back for everything that he'd done. I wanted revenge, and I wanted to save the world that I spent so many hours investing myself into. Cloud and the party head back out of the City of the Ancients. They start to make their way back to the High Wind, but just as they do, the Earth begins to shake. Something is very wrong. The scene cuts away, and you see that the planet seems to be taking issue with Shinra's plan and the planet is not going to go down without a fight. Diamond Weapon has risen up from the sea and is making its way to Midgar. The party has no choice here. Diamond is out to wreck the city, so they have to stand up to this massive creature. Now, after a hard-fought battle, we see Midgar fire the Sister Ray, blasting a massive hole right through weapon and obliterating the barrier around the northern crater. But not before Diamond managed to launch a barrage at Midgar, which we see has more than likely killed Rufus Shinra and done massive damage to the city. But things are only just starting to heat up. The High Wind heads for the Northern Crater now, ready to go face Sephiroth and end things. But Kate Sith just seems to be going haywire again. The puppet starting to send an audio of Reeve, Scarlet, and Heidegger. And they're discussing what to do now that the President is possibly dead. The Mako Cannon and the reactors are acting on their own now, charging up energy and threatening to cause a massive reaction that can destroy Midgar and everyone living there. Then we learn that Hojo is taking control and is intending to send all of that energy to Sephiroth, giving the power to his son to help him with his plan to become a god. Midgar is no longer safe. Marlene is no longer safe. Reeve has been outed by the party now as the man behind Kate Sith from the start. He's been resisting Shinra's most corrupt and evil decisions from the beginning of the game, but we know that he can be ruthless as he proved when he kidnapped Elmira and Marlene earlier to betray the group. But the truth on this situation is that the party has no choice. They have to head back into Midgar to confront Hojo and save the city. 
and there's only one way that they can get there to make this happen. Because Heidegger and Scarlet, in their stubbornness, are intent to stop Avalanche even as they're trying to help them. That old guard of Shinra is just unable to get out of their own way. In a pretty spectacular scene, the party airdrops out of the high wind down into Midgar, parachuting in before they begin to make their way to the controls of the Sister Ray, having to deal with Shinra forces all along the way. It feels really weird being back in this setting after all this time. It was familiar, but so much had changed. As a player, I'm not in the position that I started in, not even close. I know how much more there is out there now. I have felt the pain and loss, anger, sadness. Now I was back in the darkest place that I'd encountered so far in this entire world. A really full circle moment. Uh, eventually, Heidegger and Scarlet come for Cloud. And this time they're using their newest weapon, the Proud Clod. And this is the final battle with Shinra. And it's... it's sad. The battle is pretty simple, and while, yeah, the Proud Claw can hit pretty hard, it's a battle more suited for the early part of the game, which I believe is by design. You see here just how much you've grown, how much stronger you are than when you were first stepping foot in Midgar. Now, after you dispatch the Proud Claw, you've now wiped out all of the heads of Shinra. There's nothing left of this once powerful organization. They're finished. The great evil government that has dominated this planet for so long has been reduced to a broken husk. The party continues forward and confronts Hojo, the last true power in Chinra, who at this point has gone completely insane. This should be a pushover battle, I mean, he's just a scientist, but he has injected himself with Genova cells and he mutates into a monster. He's so arrogant and defiant wanting to complete his goals at all costs. But once Hojo finally falls, the party manages to take control of the reactors and bring everything back to safe levels, saving Midgar in the process. Now, it's time to return to the high wind. We have work to do. And while yes, I said we have work to do, before we move forward, there are two really important missable narrative moments that we have to cover. One of them can be done the moment you get control of the submarine if you really wish. There's a hidden tunnel that you can take in the sea that leads to a waterfall. If you have Vincent in your party, you can head in behind the waterfall where you'll encounter Lucretia, Sephiroth's mother. That's where you get a flashback and you learn about the origins of Vincent along with everything that Hojo had done to him as we discussed earlier. The reunion with her is tragic. We learn that she wanted to die, but due to the Genova cells, she'd been unable to perish, forced to live with her guilt. Lucretia never even got to hold her baby as he was taken by Hojo at birth. She asks Vincent what has happened to Sephiroth, as she's been having nightmares about her son doing something awful. And in a moment that has haunted my thoughts since I first experienced it years ago, Vincent tells Lucretia that Sephiroth is dead. I didn't get it back then, but I think now that I do. He didn't want her to know the monster that her son had become. Cloud was about to tell her, and he was stopped because Vincent knew that it would just only add to her grief. The terrible news, telling a mother that her son was dead, was actually an act of mercy here. Her story had already become so tragic and twisted, but at least this would give her a sense of closure. Now if you return later, she's gone, and we don't know if she finally perished, or if she was actually able to move on with her life here. But I like to think in my own head canon that somehow she found a way to move on. Now the second important story beat here is to revisit the Shinra mansion in Nibelheim. If you head to the lab in the basement, you finally get to learn what happened to Cloud after he defeated Sephiroth all those years ago. 
he and Zack were taken and tested on by Hojo, the two eventually escaping and traveling together. It was Zack in the driver's seat here, because Cloud was struggling with Mako exposure, just as he had in Medeal, which actually is the same reason that he never was able to join Soldier. The Mako exposure was something that his body just didn't react well to. Here, we learn more about Zack as he tells more of his story and his hopes. He wants the two to become mercenaries together. We know from this that the two were very close. Cloud and Zack were friends. And as they reach the outskirts of Midgar, the two are attacked by Shinra soldiers, where Zack is killed while trying to protect Cloud. The soldiers leave Cloud for dead as he seemed almost comatose. After they take off, Cloud is finally coming to his senses just enough to crawl to the fallen Zack, taking up the Buster Sword as he looks out on Midgar. Cloud is now carrying on the legacy of his friend, but the Mako poisoning and the tragedy messing with his mind, it just, it muddles everything and causes him to take on the mantle of Zack, the two stories melding into one in his mind. It's a bit of resolution to the story and it helps you better understand Cloud and kind of helps to grasp why it is that he had everything so twisted in his mind. It wasn't all just some concoction that he came up with on his own. There was a real purpose to it. And he was trying to do the right thing, but with everything that had gone on, all the stress, the Mako exposure, the trauma, it just all went wrong. But now, there's nothing really left to do. I could cover battling all of the optional bosses. I could cover the arena in the Gold Saucer where you battle through scores of enemies as handicaps build up and make each battle more difficult. Or the Chocobo races and Chocobo breeding, where you're working hard to be the best racer and to get stronger chocobos, you can eventually get a gold chocobo, which will go anywhere in the world. But this is a narrative look at the game. And all that's left for us to do for the story is Sephiroth. This confrontation finally has to happen. The party has to do something to try and save the planet, to recover wholly before it's too late. Cloud meets with everyone in the high wind, and he tells them that this is it. That even a win here doesn't guarantee that the planet's going to be saved. He wants everyone to go home and decide what's right for them, and if they choose to stay there, he understands. Everyone departs, well, everyone except Tifa. Like Cloud, she's lost everything. There's no home to return to. The two spend what could be their last night together. Everything they had been through, and now all they have is each other in this night. It's terrifying to imagine being in a situation as hopeless as theirs. They're fighting to save a world that doesn't even have a place for them anymore. They're fighting to avenge their fallen loved ones, but most importantly here, Cloud and Tifa, they're fighting for each other. The following morning, they awake alone and assume that nobody came back, thinking that this is just going to be all on them now. And they're okay with that. They've come to terms with it. But as they get back on board the high wind, they realize everybody's already there. They weren't abandoned. A feeling of hope surges as you realize that this party truly do believe in fighting together and that hope is still there, however small and they're going to fight for it. At this point, they head into the crater to take on Sephiroth. And this place is so different from the last time you were there. It's now warped and full of powerful monsters. The party has to split up into groups on their way down into the crater, traveling deeper and deeper into the earth. 
Once they finally reach the bottom, Genova approaches, leading to a final battle with the Calamity from the Sky. A final confrontation with this being that nearly destroyed the world years before and basically wiped out the Cetra. Now, after dispatching Genova, everything around you collapses and the party is sucked even deeper into the earth to Sephiroth. Here we can see that he is the one stopping Holy from activating. He is the one stopping Eris' prayer from being answered. And that means that he has to die. The party gets split up here and they have to face Sephiroth's first form, which is Bizarro Sephiroth. Now, this is resembling that horrifying Genova way more than any soldier of legend. Some eldritch nightmare. Now, the first time I played the game, I was disappointed seeing this Sephiroth, making fairly short work of him before things change. The battlefield warps, and we are introduced to safer Sephiroth. The One-Winged Angel. This fight can be extremely tough, as Sephiroth has devastating attacks here that just show how powerful he really is. His theatrical attacks rivaling even the wildest summons. But despite his power, Cloud and the rest of the party, they don't have the option of losing here. They have to do this. They have to win, and here they finally slay Sephiroth. The One-Winged Angel put to rest. After he falls, the crater starts to crumble and shake. Tifa tries to grab for Cloud, but he ends up falling deep, either into a pit or into his own mind. But there is still one battle remaining. A one-on-one -on -one showdown with Sephiroth. Now this is a fight that you literally cannot lose. Even if you put the controller down and walk away, eventually Sephiroth will attack and Cloud will counter with Omni Slash, his ultimate limit break, whether you've unlocked it or not. Cloud hits Sephiroth with everything he has, unleashing all of his anger, pain, sadness, everything he lets it all loose on the man who he looked up to his hero his greatest nemesis sephiroth learns true defeat here being slain by the man who wanted to be a soldier the man who failed to be a soldier this is where cloud proved to him truly that you don't have to be a legendary soldier to be a hero in this moment cloud finally defeated his demon. After the battle, Cloud comes to his senses and reaches out for Tifa. The two now are alone, trapped in the crater. And it seems like hope is lost for them again when the high wind comes crashing in to save the day. Everyone boards and the airship leaves the crater as Sid hits a switch that he wasn't even sure about what it would do. And it causes the airship to ditch its propellers, streamlining as rockets emerge and launch the massive ship away to safety. At this point, the party watches on as Holy finally activates and starts to work trying desperately to fight Meteor. But as Meteor starts crashing down to Midgar, Holy's too late. Meteor is defeating Eris' hope. That is, until the planet joins in, the life stream erupting and battling to save itself and destroy Meteor, working alongside Holy. Now the upper levels of Midgar are totally destroyed, 
but we learn through Kate Sith that he's already had everyone evacuated down to the slums. All the party can do now is watch and hope as they see the battle waging on between the two forces. And the game ends on a somber note here. So, did we save the Earth? Was it too late? After the credits roll, the game jumps ahead 500 years, where we see Red 13, Nanaki, traveling with two younger of his race as they make their way up a cliff, overlooking the ruins of Midgar. The planet survived. We have no idea what happened to anyone else, but the planet lived. You did it. It's a somber victory that leaves a lot of questions, but it lets you decide what happened. You can put the pieces together in your own mind and create your own story for how it ends. I believe, of course this is my own headcanon, that everybody went back and they rebuilt. And that while yes, we know there's a movie that came out and other games that take place after. For years, this is what we had. And it had to be enough. Final Fantasy VII broke barriers. RPGs were a niche genre, at least in the States, before this game blew everything wide open. The decision to move from the established Nintendo to make a massive game for an unproven console was a risk that absolutely paid off. No matter what, Final Fantasy VII will go down as one of the greatest and most important video games to ever release. This game helped me to figure out who I was in my formative years. Spending time in this world gave me a place to escape to, a place where I could get away from my own troubles and I could be a hero. It taught me to believe in myself and most importantly to hold on to hope no matter how dark things get. There's always a way through, you just have to keep fighting. I really hope that you've enjoyed this video. This is easily the biggest project of anything like this that I've ever attempted. And it feels so exciting to be finishing it up finally and wrapping up this script. Now, I felt so many times during this whole process that I might never finish this. That this could be what finally breaks me of doing this whole YouTube thing. But here it is. And honestly, I'm proud of what I got here. I'm by far nowhere near what I would even consider to be a good editor. I just do the best I can. And I feel like maybe maybe I've made something here that's worthwhile now did I do this game justice no I could have went on for another 10 hours and still not really done justice to Final Fantasy 7 but as it stands I've gone on two hours already and I really hope that you've enjoyed this and if you've stuck along this far thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you I'm the unhinged gamer and I look forward to seeing you again in the next one.